go right live. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your participation to the computation imaging space webinar series. This is a seminar okay, number so four. Let's get started. Oh, um, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your Yeah, let me do it again. Sorry, there was some. So yeah, this is a seminar number four, and today we have an exciting talk by Professor Cassie Bowman from Caltech for exciting work on the imaging of black hole. Before we start, let me briefly introduce Professor Kathy Bowman. Uh, Cassie, uh, Cassie, Professor Bowman is a Rosen, Rosenberg Scholar and Assistant Professor in the comp uh, Computing and Mathematical Science and Electric Engineering Department at the Car uh, California Institute of Technology. Before joining Caltech, she was a postdoc fellow in the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. She received her PhD in the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT in uh, EECS. Before coming to MIT, she received her bachelor's degree in electric engineering from the University of Michigan. The focus of her research is on using emerging computational methods to push it the boundary of interdisciplinary imaging. Now, let us welcome Professor Cassie Bowman. Thank you so much. Uh, so it's an honor uh, to be presenting at this, uh, the first space computational imaging women webinar series. Um, I, I wish we all could be in person, but it's also wonderful to see how the organizers have been able to engage even perhaps a wider community through this uh, virtual series. So uh, thank you again for inviting me. So as everyone on this call knows, you know, many things that we want to take pictures of, we can actually see with our own eyes. And um, using a standard camera, we can produce an image that looks like a scene we might want to capture. So it might be slightly blurrier or noisier version of the input image that we'd like to see, but it's still roughly that targeted scene. But in many cases, what we want to image is actually invisible to us. So, you know, as you all know, we can't use just a standard camera to take a picture of our brain. And in these cases, since it's impossibly to um, directly image the thing we want to see, we have to develop alternative ways to take indirect measurements. Uh, for instance, using the MRI scanner. And these measurements don't look anything like the image we're trying to capture. And so we have to design algorithms that work with the new sensing system in order to require, rec uh, recover the desired picture. And you all know this as computational imaging, which uh, uh, many of you are, are working in. And so uh, many of you use the similar methodology of designing systems that tightly integrate sensor and algorithm design to exceed fundamental limits of current sensors. And in my work, I've uh, worked on applying this methodology to a number of different uh, scientific domains. But today I'm gonna focus mostly on telling you a little bit about how we've been able to use this methodology to reveal what I think of as the ultimate invisible, uh, which are black holes. So black holes are one of the most you know, mysterious objects in the universe, and scientists have been studying them ever since they were first predicted uh, by Einstein's theory of general relativity just over 100 years ago. And in particular, for decades, scientists have been studying the giant elliptical galaxy at the head of the Virgo constellation. So this galaxy is called M87. Um, it's 55 million light years away from us, and it's very special because over 100 years ago, someone actually discovered a streak of light on the sky, uh, which ended up being a galactic scale jet of plasma that was shooting out of the core of this galaxy and marking the spot of a supermassive black hole. And so over decades, scientists developed better and better instruments to try to study this supermassive black hole predicted to be at the center. And in April of 2017, we hooked up this Earth-sized telescope and collected the data necessary to make the first picture of a black hole. And so two years later, after processing the data, this is what we saw in, uh, and showed you guys last April. And so this black hole image uh, was the result of a group of hundreds of scientists from around the globe that worked together to build a computational Earth-sized telescope that could take the first picture of a black hole, resolve structure on the scale of a black hole's event horizon for the first time. 
So today I want to tell you a very abridged story of how we were able to capture a picture of a black hole. There are many angles to the story, so I hope to give you a glimpse of kind of my primary contribution, which was how the imaging was done and how we kind of validated that image. Um, and then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk a bit more about techniques currently being developed in, in my group at Caltech to push the Event Horizon Telescope past its current limits to see environments around black holes that are still invisible to us now. And so uh, the two topics I'm going to discuss today are developing methods to extract information about uh, not just the static structure of the black hole, but about the stochastic motion of a black hole and developing machine learning methods to optimize the placement of the next telescopes we build into the Earth-sized telescope array. Okay, so the first question you might ask is how are we even able to take a picture of a black hole that by definition doesn't let light escape, right? So it should be unseeable. Well, light propagating near a black hole doesn't follow straight lines. Because the black hole is so massive, it's curving the space time around it, and so photons can even go in complete circles around the black hole. So the gas, the space around the black hole is lit up by this hot gas that is spinning around. It's heated to hundreds of billions of degrees. So we have these photons that are zipping around everywhere and some of them fall into the black hole, but other ones just graze the black hole so that they're bent around it and such that the net effect is essentially that the black hole casts a shadow on a backdrop of bright surrounding emission um, that it's almost perfectly circular, this ring that appears. And if Einstein was right about general relativity, then this light would be bent into a ring whose size and shape tell us about the mass and the spin of the black hole. And so this ring is referred to as the black hole shadow. Um, and this is a more of a realistic simulation of what we would expect to see if we were able to see at, you know, basically infinite resolution at around a one millimeter wavelength. Um, so that's great, you know, the area around the black hole is lit up in some way, and so we have some idea of it, we should be able to see some imprint of the black hole on this on the space around it. But even though we are able to see this imprint, um, you know, theoretically taking this picture still seems nearly impossible. And that's because a ring of this size is incredibly small. It's, it's about 40 micro arc seconds in size, which is about the same size as a grain of sand. But when that grain of sand is in New York and we're, I'm viewing it from here in Pasadena, uh, California. Um, and so, you know, taking a picture of something that is that small is really difficult because of the limits of diffraction. So if we plug, uh, so we are able to see this ring of light at a certain wavelength um, and it's a certain size we know. So if we plug in the wavelength and the required angular resolution necessary to see the black hole shadow into the diffraction limit equation, we can uh, calculate that in order to see the black hole's ring, we need to just build a telescope that's 13 million meters across or essentially the size of the Earth. And if we could build this Earth-sized telescope, we could just start to make out that distinctive ring of light that's indicative of the black hole's event horizon. Okay, so although building a single dish telescope the size of the Earth isn't possible, uh, by joining telescopes located around the world, uh, I've been working as part of an international collaboration that has built an, a computational telescope the size of the Earth capable of resolving structure on the scale of a black hole's event horizon for the first time. And this combining telescopes in this way is called a very long baseline interferometry or VLBI. So it's just an interferometry technique, but over Earth-sized baselines. So how exactly does that work? Uh, well, the Event Horizon Telescope is composed of telescopes from around the world that were originally built for other purposes. So here I'm showing some telescopes in the different places, uh, in Mexico, uh, Chile, Spain, the South Pole, Hawaii, uh, Arizona, and by in installing specialized equipment at each of these sites and linking the signals through the precise timing of atomic clocks, we've been able to make these originally disjoint telescopes work together. And so teams of researchers at each of the telescopes, we travel to the sites and we essentially freeze the light by recording petabytes of data. And then our computers process the data to act like the lens to make the, the final picture. And so my primary role in the project was on constructing an image from the data that was taken and reduced down from these disjoint telescopes. And so the next question you might have is, well, how do we do that? 
Well, unlike with a camera, in the Event Horizon Telescope, we don't capture the picture in pixel space, but we instead take it, it, it captured in frequency space. So we essentially take measurements of the black hole images for a transform. And if we put telescopes all across the globe, we would sample all these spatial frequency measurements. But since we only have telescopes at a few locations, that means we only get a sparse number of measurements. And so it turns out that for every two telescopes in the telescope array, we get a single measurement of the underlying images 2D spatial frequency that's related to the projected baseline between the telescopes. Um, so each of these measurements, this is a point in the um, 2D spatial frequency plane. So each of these points is complex, meaning it can be described by the two numbers, the am its amplitude and its phase. So in 2017, we observed the black holes with eight different telescopes around the world, but actually only five of these telescopes uh, were, at, uh, were able to see the black hole in, in M87 and we're at different locations that were at distinct locations. And so that would have been only five choose uh, two place uh, measurements that we would be able to make um, because there were only five different telescope locations on the world that, that uh, different telescope locations in the world that could see M87. And we look at pairs of telescopes to get a measurement. So five choose two is 10 measurements, which is an incredibly small number of points to try to recover an image from. However, as the Earth rotates, we obtain other new measurements. So since the baselines between telescopes change as the Earth rotates, this amounts to carving out these different elliptical paths in the spatial frequency plane. So um, that's great. And the, what do we get from these measurements exactly? Well, when you have telescopes that are close together, then these are going to probe low spatial frequencies because the baseline is small. So they're going to give you broad structure in the image. So to get the fine detail we needed to see uh, the, the details of the ring, you have to put your telescope out far apart, as far apart as possible, right? OK, so now that we know what we could ideally capture from these telescopes, how do we actually get these measurements? Well, we get these measurements by recording hundreds of terabytes of data at each of the telescopes. So here you see my friend uh, Lindsay Blackburn posing with about a half a petabyte of data that was co uh, collected just at one of the telescopes, the LMT telescope in Mexico. And this wasn't even all the data we collected from it that year. And so we recorded so much data that we can't send it over the internet and it has to be flown to a common location. And then at that common location, we use a special purpose, a supercomputer called a correlator to combine the precisely timed data and once this is done, this is passed on to a calibration stage, which finds weak signals hidden in the correlator output and tunes the parameters to basically just extract a stronger signal. And so developing the calibration pipelines, uh, we had to develop these uh, new algorithms for the EHT, which is a huge endeavor. And so I just wanna uh, call out Lindy and uh, a lot of the other members of the calibration team who, uh, for instance, uh, CK, Machik, Sarah, and Michael, uh, uh, who made it possible to extract this kind of weak signal from, from this data. And without these measurements, we would have never been able to make a picture. So how do we make a picture then after extracting these measurements? Well, at this point, we have the data. And so we can kind of abstract away the astrophysics of the problem and think of it as just purely a computational imaging problem. Uh, we have sparse data um, and our challenge is to find the image that caused it. And if we were given measurements that covered the entire frequency plane, it would be trivial to recover an image because in the case of no noise, you would just simply need to apply an inverse Fourier transform to the measurements. Remember, our measurements are frequency um, components of, of the image. However, we only are seeing a few samples. And so that means that there are um, an infinite number of possible images that are going to be perfectly consistent with the data we measure. And on top of that, the fact that there's a different quickly changing atmosphere above the telescope across the, uh, across the globe causes our data to be really noisy and makes the problem even more ill-posed. And so what does this noise look like? I, I like to explain a little bit the process of how, how uh, we get the measurements and how the noise, atmospheric noise corrupts those measurements. 
because it informs how we actually go about approaching the reconstruction task. So the whole reason the Event Horizon Telescope or just interferometry, radio interferometry works in the first place is due to the fact that light from the black hole is going to travel to Earth for 55 million years, and then it's going to reach one of the telescopes slightly before the other one. And that time delay is the key component for extracting the 2D spatial frequency measurement that's used for image reconstruction. But when you have a telescope in Chile and another one in Hawaii and another one in Spain, they're all going to have different atmospheres above them. And each atmosphere is going to cause an additional propagation delay for the signal. So it's going to add an additional time delay, um, which is going to um, re result in um, another phase delay in each frequency measurement. So basically, the atmosphere here is going to just is going to scramble the phase terms by a random phase. And similarly, the atmosphere also causes a different attenuation factor, causing a changing absolute gain term. So as you can imagine, this error is very challenging because ideally, we would measure this nice, beautiful FOIA component, the italicized V here. But in reality, we first have a, you know, include a completely random phase error, which is going to rotate that measurement and then scale it by a, a pretty bad amplitude error as well, oftentimes. And so the measurement that we actually get looks nothing like the ideal one that is related to the image in the sky. And so that's pretty terrible because at first glance, we've lost both the amplitude and the phase information. And so if you've lost both amplitude and phase, what really do you have left, right? But, but we, we kind of get lucky and that's because our measurement terms have a structure to them. And that's that uh, these measurements, uh, the, the corruptions are site-based. They appear at every telescope, but all our measurements come from pairs of telescopes. So remember, every measurement comes from two telescopes. And so every measurement is going to incorporate the corruption from two different telescopes. So that means if we have a third telescope, then the measurement that is formed with that third telescope shares some of the same corrupting terms, in this case, G2 and Phi2. And so we design imaging algorithms to take advantage of this redundant corruption when solving for our images. So because we have more measurements than we have sites, we can try to solve for this, this corruption. And so essentially, we, we, we're solving a constrained phase retrieval problem. Uh, also, at the same time, a, a kind of a amplitude retrieval, but the phase retrieval is the, is the more challenging part. And so to do this, we developed two different kinds of classes of imaging algorithms to tackle the problem. The first class of algorithms is based on a very standard method used in the radio interferometry community that was developed uh, decades ago, and it's called CLEAN uh, with an iterative self-calibration loop. And, and so the, the self-calibration loop is to deal with those, uh, that, that, um, the corruption of the terms, the calibration errors. And so this is a traditional method of making images in the community, which is a huge plus because it's understood in the community, it's vetted in that community, um, and people um, under people like using this method. But the disadvantage is that these methods were originally developed for telescope arrays that have many more telescopes, don't have the same kind of corrupting noise that we have in the EHT data. And so the big disadvantage is that sometimes these methods are so sensitive, are, are, are sensitive and so you need to have a significant amount of guidance from a knowledgeable user to move it in a good direction. And they do this by laying down what are called clean boxes, which are like the region where you expect the light to form in the image. So you have, you, there's definitely interaction with a human user to make an image. Um, and so a second class of methods and uh, is one that I started working on with uh, a number of people in the EHT. Um, and that was because we saw the challenges with the clean method and we wanted to try to develop uh, regularized maximum likelihood approaches to try to do similar, um, to also do, uh, create images. Um, and in this method, we don't try to find an inverse function that takes us directly from the measurements to a picture, but instead we try to find a picture that both fits the measurements and it is what it defined as likely through some sort of image regular, regularizer applier, just kind of your basic kind of Bayesian um, inference approach. Um, uh, and of course, the disadvantage here is that we have to define what is a likely image, and that's going to introduce some sort of bias. 
But the huge advantage being here is that we can naturally incorporate all these different kinds of errors um, that we expect to see in the data likelihood term. And so, um, we, so for, for that reason, uh, we can, for instance, directly optimize an image with constraints that are insensitive to the atmosphere um, air that I described earlier. Okay, so both of these methods, you know, uh, any, any method, in fact, that we'd come up with, whether it's an older method or a newer fancy machine learning approach, we're always going to require, because our data is sparse and noisy, we always have to inject some sort of information into the problem about what images look like um, to get something back in the end, to recover an image. And so that's always going to bias our final picture, of course. Um, and so they're just going to bias it in different ways, depending on how we in inject different information. Um, and be especially because we were trying to image something that we didn't had never seen before, it was really important that we un that we don't bias it in certain directions, uh, a certain pr uh, preferred directions, um, based upon, for instance, the physics of the problem. We really wanted to avoid that. And so, for instance, we wouldn't even want to accidentally have a preference for ring images and then be super excited that we recovered a ring back in the end. So we had to be really careful when imaging so that we understood the biases that we introduced in each of these algorithms uh, and make sure that they were not significant, not affecting our scientific conclusions. And so the big question we face in dealing with M87 is how do we verify what we're reconstructing with our imaging algorithms is real. And in the first step, in order to avoid shared human bias and assess common features among independent reconstructions, uh, we split ourselves into groups. And we split about 40 people who worked into imaging into four teams. Uh, these 40 people either uh, developed imaging methods or they were just really knowledgeable users of, of imaging methods. And these four teams, we had, they span the earth. And when we received the data of the black hole, we actually ran into our different uh, rooms and we um, tried making images, but we didn't talk to each other at all during the imaging process. So we worked in isolation, trying to make the best image from the data for seven weeks. And then after seven weeks, we all gathered in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we revealed the images to each other. And this is what we saw. So this was uh, quite amazing. Uh, uh, although every picture was different, uh, they all reconstructed the same basic structure a ring of roughly 40 micro arc seconds that was brighter on the bottom than the top. And seeing these images was one of the happiest moments I had in the collaboration because although I had been able to make an image with, you know, my method that I had been developing, I, you know, until I saw that other people using different methods with different biases all kind of got the same basic structure that I really believed that this is, this might be real. <laughs> and it brought our results to a whole other level of confidence and, you know, we found the same structure no matter what person or method reconstructed the data. But just because this test had allowed us to avoid shared human bias, it doesn't mean that there wasn't still human bias. For instance, maybe we all still wanted to see a ring. And so we, we spent the next couple of months essentially trying to break our images. And that led to the second step where we had tried to objectively choose image parameters and remove humans from the loop as much as possible. And to do this, we developed three different imaging pipelines. These pipelines, you can actually, you could download them online um, along with the data to make you know, images and to improve the methods to make even better images. Um, but these ones uh, th that we had um, all had individual knobs on them, you know, parameter settings. And these parameter settings are usually tuned by a human user. But instead of having a human tune them, we wanted to instead search for the best set of parameter settings recover different kinds of source structures and see how those then resulting uh, settings uh, affected the M87 results we got in the end. How did the black hole image change based upon them? And so for instance, we generated synthetic data as if the Event Horizon Telescope were actually seeing a disk on the sky with no hole in the center. And then we found the best parameter settings to recover this disk shape. And then when transferring these exact parameters, onto the M87 data. Although we had tried our hardest to find parameters that we recover a disk with no hole in the center, we saw that our data in the method required us to still put the hole there. And so by doing this simple training and testing procedure on many different types of underlying sources, we saw that our methods always preferred this ring shape. 
And that was true no matter the day we observed M87 on or the imaging code we used to reconstruct it. And so by blurring the images from different imaging pipelines to an equivalent resolution, we then averaged them to form the image uh, that we showed the rest of the world last April, which again is just, you know, something that uh, we were very confident of, this ring of light, roughly 40 micro arc seconds in size and brighter on the bottom than the top. Um, so we were really excited. We had, you know, got an image that had appeared and uh, fairly robustly, but we still weren't sure. And so we wanted to go through a number of validation tests. Um, and so uh, we did a lot of these kind of different tests on this. I'm only going to briefly talk about one of the tests we did, but you can always look back at our papers for the additional tests in detail. So previously I talked about how we selected one set of parameters, theta, that performed best on some synthetic data. But why should there only be one parameter set we consider? And in fact, a lot of times, uh, by doing large parameter surveys, we actually found that there are often many parameters that perform reasonably well on synthetic data. So there are different combinations of parameters that perform uh, to an acceptable level. And so instead of just choosing one beta, we instead set a threshold of how, how well do we want it to perform on synthetic data. And then we found all the parameter settings that performed above that level. Um, and so for instance, in one of the imaging pipelines, we ran hundreds of thousands of simulations, and then we found 1,500 parameter settings uh, that were acceptable. Um, so then we could run all of these parameter settings um, on the M87 data and look for differences that resulted in the images. And so here is an example of after we had run the 1,500 parameter settings uh, on the M87 data, what kind of variations did we see? So on the left, you see the mean image. These are aligned, the aligned mean image we saw where you see that ring structure. In the middle is showing the standard deviation, uh, which is gonna tell us where we have most variations in the image. And you notice that along the ring, we do have these little re knot regions, uh, which do have a higher standard deviation, uh, which means that we have less certainty of, of, the, of the flux in that region. Um, and it's due to the interplay between uh, the source structures, the size of the source, and the point spread function uh, based upon where the telescopes are located. But if you look at the standard deviation, the actual value of that standard deviation relative to how bright the ring is, is by looking at the fractional standard deviation, you notice that we have, uh, that it's quite small. And so we actually have a lot of confidence in that ring. That a ring appears in most uh, of the images that we reconstruct, most all of them. But what we don't have confidence is, is all that wispy structure on the outside. So you shouldn't, shouldn't believe any of that stuff. Okay, so we've re recovered this beautiful image of the light encircling a black hole, or at least it's beautiful in my, in my mind. Uh, but one question you might have at this point is, what did we learn from this picture? So for instance, one question I get a lot is, did we prove Einstein was right? And well, I like to say the short answer is no, we didn't, but we also didn't prove we was wrong, which is a pretty big deal too. So. I'd like to kind of explain how we can use at a high level, how we can use this image to better understand uh, gravity and also um, uh, just an understanding of black holes in general. So for any science object, you can calculate its escape velocity, the critical velocity necessary for an object to launch off to infinity. Um, you can calculate it. You might remember it from high school physics, the square root of 2gm over r. Um, and notice that this equation isn't depending at all on the mass of the object you're trying to launch. So what happens uh, if the escape velocity is more than the speed of light? So, uh, it, so it's not dependent on the speed of uh, the mass of the object you're trying to launch, but it is dependent on the mass of the object you're trying to launch from. Okay, so if we set the escape velocity to the speed of light, uh, then, then that means that light won't be able to escape um, and you're gonna get this dark star or black hole. So if you take a fixed size mass from this equation, you can calculate the particular size you need to compress it into in order to get a black hole. And that critical radius is called the Schwarzschild radius. But actually what we generally expect to see is not the event horizon itself, but instead the point at which photons are orbiting around the black hole um, on this, what is called a photon orbit. Um, and, but this is an instable orbit. So when the photons fly off towards us, towards Earth, um, they're actually lensed by the immense gravity of the black hole, 
And so it actually, the ring appears larger to us. It becomes bigger. And so for a non-spinning black hole, the diameter is 5.2 times the Schwarzschild radius. And for a black hole that's spinning, it appears smaller. So it gets pulled in a little bit. Um, and so this is the range of diameters between 4.8 and 5.2 times the Schwarzschild radius that we'd expect the ring size to be, the bright ring size to be for a black hole that's obeying canonical general relativity. And notice that this is directly depending on the mass of that black hole. So for a smaller mass black hole, this ring becomes smaller. And that's interesting because actually from past measurements of M87's mass, it was really unclear what, what it was. Uh, gas dynamics pointed us towards about three and a half billion solar masses. But stellar dynamics pointed us more towards six and a half billion solar, di uh, stellar dynamics, uh, solar masses. And stellar dynamics really provided an upper limit as there couldn't be more mass within the, the stellar orbit than from just the black hole. And so we wouldn't expect uh, a ring any bigger than the yellow one. Uh, okay, uh, so this is a way that we can weigh black holes, but we could also ask ourselves, is this a black hole at all? So we could test our, 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 um, for other, other, we could test other exotic objects. For instance, wormholes also produce shadow features, but wormholes uh, for the same size mass have a smaller shadow than a black hole. Uh, so here it is for a six and a half uh, billion solar mass um, wormhole. And there's also things called naked singularities or super splitting black holes that also produce shadows and they would even be smaller. And so you can lay the event horizon telescope image on top of the ball and instantly rule out all these other exotic possibilities. And we're left with a ring that matches nearly perfectly with the stellar dynamical measurement of the black hole mass of six and a half billion solar masses uh, when obeying canonical general relativity. So this is just one of the many things we can learn about black holes and gravity by studying this image. But perhaps one of the most amazing we see is that by comparing this picture to simulations scientists have made for years, we find that the image we've taken is amazingly consistent with the number of these predictions. Uh, but you might notice that that simulation I just showed you, it's moving. So you might ask, is our recovered M87 image, uh, is our recovered M87 images, are they also moving? And it turns out that it actually is. So we actually observed M87 over a span of a week, four nights over that span of a week. And if you independently reconstruct each of those uh, images, and you can string them together into a movie. And when you play that movie, you'll notice that there's some evolution. So I'll play it for you here. So it's really tough to see. So I'm going to play it again. You'll notice that there's uh, the kind of the bright spot on the bottom goes a little bit more from the left to the right. So we don't have a good idea of what exactly is causing this variation. Is it rotation or just material lighting up? And we're even unsure where it's appearing in the image domain. We're not even confident about that right here. But what we are really sure of is that the time variability exists. And that because, is because it appears in the raw measurements we take. So if you look at the measurements, uh, here uh, um, I'm plotting some measurements across two of the days, uh, across the four day span, you see that there's a, a closure, that, that these measurements are different. And it tells us that something definitely has changed. And actually getting a hold on a black hole's time variability is quite important for a number of reasons. So it doesn't only give us a window into the dynamics around a black hole, uh, which will hopefully help us in understanding things like how does a black hole launch these powerful galactic scale jets that come out of them, but also mapping the dynamics will help us in mapping the space time of a black hole, um, and then even constraining our prediction of general relativity even further. And so as awesome as M87 has been, there's actually another black hole uh, the EHT is interested in that might just help us even more in answering these questions. And that black hole is called Sagittarius A star, um, or Sag A star for short, and it's at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And Sag A star is teeny compared to M87. Um, M87, again, is six and a half billion solar masses. Uh, uh, um, Sag A star is only a measly four million solar masses. But because it's much closer to us, it appears about the same size in the sky. 
But since it's so small, actually like physically small, that means that the gas actually orbits around it much more quickly. So whereas it takes four to 30 days to make a complete orbit of the gas around M87, for Saturn star, it's making a full orbit every four to 30 minutes. So it's zipping around really fast. And so we love to recover the dynamics of gas flowing around Sag A star. It would be like a holy grail for us, but this is really challenging. And that's because um, the data we collect from a dynamic black hole that's evolving over the course of just minutes uh, is very different. So that's stimulated in blue here. That's very different from how the data would look if the source were static as shown in magenta. So how can we recover this evolution? Well, we could break the night up into segments and image each region of time, um, think, you know, assuming each region kind of is from a static image to form a video. So you could do this like snapshot imaging. Um, but if we were to apply the same static imaging methods as before and try to reconstruct each snapshot, there's just such a small number of measurements seen at each time, the data is just far too sparse um, and we, we just get gibberish. We, it just results in uninformative images. So how should we go about recovering this underlying motion? Well, we've been developing methods that propagate information through time to try to use all of the measurements simultaneously with the knowledge that uh, although the image is changing, there's some continuity to those changes. So one approach is to model the data as part of a graphical model with three components. Uh, the first component saying that each image X of T should be consistent with the data collected at that time, Y of T, the second component saying that each image should look like how we expect images to look like be a sample from some sort of image prior. And the third is that neighboring frames in time should look similar to one another. And so by maximizing the probability of this joint distribution, we're able to change images from looking something like this to like this. And so here on the left is showing for, for the simulation, the synthetic ground truth video, and on the right is a video reconstruction obtained from this method when we assume the measurements were samples from the Event Horizon Telescope Array. Okay, and so this is a big improvement from the random gibberish we've seen before, but it's still not really what we wanted. Here, we have this recovered, uh, what we've recovered is something like the average image structure. So it will give us a lot of information like the ring size, which we didn't see before, but this video has lost all information about how gas is flowing around that black hole. The dynamics have been totally lost. So although imaging is crucial in making sure we give ourselves the flexibility to see something surprising, perhaps, you know, if our ultimate goal is to understand, understand that underlying motion, maybe it's not the right approach to, um, for uh, extracting the dynamics. So instead, um, maybe we would want to uh, recover some parameters, for instance, of a persistent flow field. So, you know, looking at this movie, maybe the simplest thing you want to know is, is the gas spinning counterclockwise or clockwise? But more generically, we could, we could try to recover an underlying flow field that descri describes the evolution in the source over time, you know, similar to something like optical flow. Um, a non parametric field like this would give us the flexibility to describe um, arbitrary evolution in the underlying source. So it has a lot of flexibility. Um, alternatively, we could also imagine wanting to describe the underlying flow field with a physical model of black hole. So it's kind of the opposite of just a non parametric flow field. For instance, we could search in the space of parameters that produce different synthetic black hole videos and try to find the parameter setting that best matches the data we've observed. And while this theoretically may be possible to do, in reality, this is just too computationally expensive. Simulating just 60,000 static image snapshots of the black hole in M87 uh, for the papers that we released last year, and the, again, these are just static snapshots, it took over 75 million core hours to complete. And so it's not something we would want to naively search over using something like an MCMC sampling method. These, uh, these simulations are very expensive. And so there's a spectrum of different approaches that we can take in trying to recover the underlying motion of a source. On one end is recovering a non-parametric flow field, uh, which is maximally flexible model, but requires us to recover a movie of flow fields. And in the end, it's not necessarily maybe very uh, interpretable. And on the other end is the spectrum of estimating the parameters of a physics-based black hole model, 
And while this result would be maximally interpretable, the approach has the disadvantage that we're tied to a particular black hole model that is not necessarily and most likely actually not correct. Um, and therefore, it's going to be overly restrictive. Uh, it might be overly restrictive. And so, and also both of these are impractical from a computational perspective. And so rather than picking one of these extreme options, we would like to find a middle ground using a model that balances the pros and cons of these different approaches whilst being computationally efficient. And towards that end, we've been working on modeling the persistent evolution of a black hole source uh, as a result of a stochastic evection diffusion process and solving for the underlying parameters of the model that best fit the observed measurements. Um, this work is led by Aviad Levis, who, who joined my group uh, at Caltech at the end of January. So this is very much a work in progress, but I'm really excited by it. So I kind of just wanted to give you a highlight of things to come. Uh, so the uh, intermediate option um, that we're going to try to solve for tries to find a, basically a compression of the motion field by asking us to only match persistent motion statistics while still being flexible in what types of evolution it allows us to model. Um, so since it's not uh, tied to any particular black hole model, it allows us that flexibility. So let's dive in a little bit more. So here I show an equation of a stochastic PDA, PDE, the partial differ differential equation we're working with, which describes the advection diffusion process. And in this process, there are two parameters that we really care about, uh, V and D, uh, where, which V is the velocity field, that describes how the bulk is moving, and D is the uh, diffusion field, which describes how material spreads out in the image. So, for instance, in these two cups containing water with different, they have different non-isotopic diffusion fields, resulting in the dye spreading out differently in them. And therefore, you could imagine describing the motion of the dye in these cups of water using a PDE, using this PDE with different underlying parameters. And so, by solving for rho here we obtain movies that obey this advection diffusion process under different parameter settings that we set for V and D. And so on the video on the left has the swirling motion and the video on the right has this more radial motion and this feeling of motion is defined by these parameters, V and D. And so by turning these param uh, parameters appropriately, you can see that we can recover flow fields that mimic uh, like a smoothly evolving black hole simulation, kind of what we see in the simulations even though they actually aren't a black hole simulation themselves. And so, although this advection diffusion process is not a black hole, uh, is not a model of black hole evolution, it could still be used to model the flow fields that are perceptually similar to those seen in the black hole simulations. And in fact, using this advection diffusion process was proposed by black hole physicists, Charles Gammy and David Lee at UIUC, um, who are working with us as a lightweight alternative to running uh, a full black hole simulation. Okay. Great, so our goal is to find these parameters of V and D that best describe our observed source motion, but there is a catch, and that's, the catch is that this is a stochastic PDE, meaning that on the right side of the equation, we have this forcing term, epsilon, that adds randomness to our resulting movie. And so we first have to draw a random movie of epsilon, perhaps from a white Gaussian distribution, and then under, uh, under that fixed epsilon, we solve for a video row, okay? And if we solve for videos under different draws of epsilon with the same V and D parameters, we see that the general feel of the motion, the motion distribution is consistent across the videos, except the pixel, for pixel video uh, values are very different. And so it's hard to actually figure out how do we optimize for the best parameters when we can't optimize for pixel, 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 to pixel differences. Um, we don't want to estimate this, uh, this unknown force, and we don't know this unknown force. So we have to develop methods that are invariant to its effects when we're covering parameters of the stochastic PDE. And although we're still in very, very early days, we've begun to get um, results on simple experiments that show we're able to extract the evection diffusion parameters from a single observation without knowing anything about the initial forcing term. So again, this is something that Aviad is actively working on now, but it's something I'm pretty excited about because it means we might have a chance of using uh, these noisy and sparse EHT measurements to not just recover a static image, but recover more about the dynamics of the underlying source that will surely lead to more science. But as important as it is to continue pushing on the algorithmic approaches to squeeze more out of the data, 
we've um, the, the data we've already collected, it's also important to realize that to extract more science, we also have to think about improving not just our algorithms that analyze the data, but also our instruments that collect the data to begin with. And so that leads to the last part of my talk today on using machine learning for optimal telescope design. So in 2017, we observed with just six telescope locations around the Earth, and making an image was a real challenge with that small number of, no, um, of measurements. And so although in the end we were confident in the ring shape we have for M87, it took us over a year to build that confidence. Um, and so we have been building out our array to get more data, adding telescopes in Greenland, France, Arizona. And the one I'm most excited about is we recently got funding to add a telescope at Caltech's Owen Valley, Owens Valley Radio Observatory. And so I'm really excited that now I'm at Caltech um, and Caltech is becoming part of the EHT telescope. But imagine what we could do if we added 10 more. So maybe we could actually make that video of the gas falling into the black hole in our center of, in the center of our galaxy. And being able to do this would be a huge scientific goldmine. But before we just plop down a bunch of telescopes, we have to be really careful. Building a new telescope is expensive. It's millions, tens of millions of dollars. And so we should try to optimize to find the, bet, the locations that will give us the biggest bang for our buck. And so how should we go about solving for the location of telescopes in the next generation of it? Well, typically the design of the sensor is idealized and constrained independently from the image reconstruction problem. And, and in doing so, a lot of assumptions are made. For instance, ignoring the non-linearities of the systems or complexities in the noise, and especially for problems where the data is so correlated and the noise is so challenging, it's a huge missed opportunity to not consider them. And so because these problems are so intimately related, I think I don't have to convince you guys that we really should be trying to optimize them jointly. They, they really work together. And so how should we go about trying to solve this? Well, it turns out if you rearrange the blocks in this diagram, you notice it looks very similar to an autoencoder where the sensing system is like the encoder, the telescope array is like the encoder, it produces these measurements or codes, and the image algorithm is the decoder. And so, as you know, deep encoders where the encoder and decoder or neural networks are often used for image compression. Um, and so maybe we can use the same thing for our own problem. So in the reconstruction problem, we could use uh, an arbitrary mathematical function that takes you from the measurements to an image for the reconstruction. This just has to be something that we can code up in a computer. And so we could use a neural network for the image reconstruction decoder. But unlike generic deep encoders, sensing systems that we build must obey physical constraints. We can't just build any mathematical function we come up with, right? And so um, we have to make sure that the encoder we build uh, is something that we, uh, so the encoder that we learn is actually something we can build. And so, I've uh, been working on this problem at Caltech with my postdoc Hassan, who has been leading this effort. And the approach that ha, uh, proposed that we proposed is to develop a physics-constrained encoder um, that we train with the decoder end to end. So let's let's uh, uh, zoom in. So from an input image Z, we can define a forward model of the measurements that we expect to collect. In this example. We pretend we have three possible telescopes to sample of, for instance, color coded um, blue, red, and green. And these indicate measurements that come from the telescopes as colored dots. And these measurements can be complicated, nonlinear, correlated, noisy. Um, and here uh, we show all the possible samples. And so we can pass all these possible samples on as collected measurements to the decoder. But that means that we'd actually have to build all these telescopes, right? So our goal is to choose among them to find the best to build. And so to do that, we introduce what we call a sensor sampling distribution that characterizes the probability that we sample from a particular telescope. And so we sample telescopes from this distribution and mask out any measurements that were not produced by these telescopes. So now just the red and blue dots remain. And every time we sample from this probability distribution, we sample different combinations of telescopes and obtain a different observed measurements. Um, and so every time we sample, we obtain a different uh, set of possible measurements, a different subset of possible measurements. 
that are then passed on to the decoder to recover an image. And we can string all the pieces up in together of this into a single differentiable network with the trainable blocks highlighted in red, uh, which are the sensor sampling distribution where we sample from, um, so the parameters of that distribution and the image reconstruction network. So this is a co-design problem. And our ultimate goal is to use this network to learn the optimal probability distribution of the networks to build, of telescopes to build. And we do that by maximizing the similarity between the input and output images, the sensor sorcity. So we want to build as few telescopes as possible. And we also include a sampling diversity term to make sure we've looked at all the possible different kinds of um, telescope setups. And then this learns the sensor sampling distribution parameters during end to end training. So our, our goal is to find the parameters of that sensor and sampling distribution. So what is the sensor sampling model that we search uh, under? So we use, we model our sensor sampling distribution as a, bully, uh, a binary fully connected Markov random field or an IC model that indicates which sensors uh, we should turn on and off and also how the sensors are correlated with one another. And so these parameters are learned during the end-to-end -end training. So here's an example of tel a telescope distribution that we have learned. The IC model parameters on the left, theta JJ, quantify the activity or importance of a single telescope. And the model parameters, theta JK, on the right, quantify the correlation between pairs of telescopes. And so red is representing positive correlation and blue, negative correlation here. And from these recovered distributions, we can see some patterns that we expect to see. For instance, in the case of uncorrelated noise, in many cases, co-located telescopes are heavily penalized from, from sampling together. And that's because they're producing the exact same measurement. So why would you sample the same measurement twice? But my favorite is not the things we would expect to see, but the things we don't know what we expect. So for instance, by changing the type of noise we train with, we can also see how this affects the noise. So for instance, Here's the result with purely Gaussian thermal noise included on the measurement. But when we include that difficult atmospheric phase air that plagues the measurement, the array preferences change fairly drastically. So I can flip between the two, you can see. Um, and so we, I really like this because it tells us about what structures and geometry that are preferred in the case of this challenging uh, data. And complicated correlate, correlated noise like this is not something that people can easily consider analytically. And so I'm really excited to be able to handle these much more complicated models of the noise and learn from them. We can also investigate which nights would be most influential if we built just a single telescope there to add to the EHT array. And another thing I really like is that this is a co-design problem. So we can just we can just take out that image reconstruction network and plug it in with whatever our ultimate goal is. So let's instead say, instead of e image reconstruction, our goal is to extract some sort of feature. For instance, classify some black hole property uh, between maybe we want to classify it into, is it a mad uh, black hole or a sane black hole, which are two possible classifications of black holes. And in this case, we can also just, you know, train our network in the same way. And when we do this, we still, we also get slightly different preferences in what telescopes are preferred, the network of the telescope that's preferred. And in this case, it turned out that the network preferences were kind of similar, although you do notice that the South Pole Telescope is more important in the classification task. And the South Pole Telescope provides long baselines, which gives you high um, spatial frequency information. So that might be why it's more important for classification. It might be using more fine structure. And so using this approach, we're starting to understand where we might be wanting to place our next ground-based telescopes to reveal more of the unseen. And I'm also excited we may soon be applying it to a variety of other scenarios, including even the optimal placement of telescopes in space. But as I said at the beginning, the synergy of sensor design and algorithm development can be a very powerful tool in a number of applications, just not black hole imaging. And so the technique I presented for jointly learning the sensor sampling distribution um, it's actually a very general framework. We just need to um, replace the final, the, the reconstruction network with whatever task you have in the forward model. And so we've also been applying this method into other domains, including Fourier tachography, microscopy, and fast MRI. And so by merging artificial intelligence and sensing in ways such as this, we hope to spark a new generation of computational cameras 
where we can use machines to help us de develop optimized cameras that exceed limitations of traditional theory and human ingenuity. And so to close, it's clear we've learned a lot from this black hole image of M87 already, but what I hope I've gotten across in this talk today is that really we're just at the beginning. And now that we have this new extreme laboratory of gravity, we're thinking of all the ways in the future that we can improve our instrument and algorithms to learn even more, to jointly help with uh, joining ideas from AI um, into both the, the sensor design and algorithm design to extract more from our data. And so hopefully one day we won't just be able to show you a static image of a black hole, but a movie of a black hole as the gas is slowly falling towards its event horizon. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. And also Ha and uh, Aviad are both here to, to take questions as well. So happy, happy to take questions. So I can take questions from the Q&A box. Um, <laughs> okay, so I have uh, the first uh, question. Uh, well, let me answer some technical questions first and then I can go back to this. Um, use radiometers and signals. Okay, I have a question from Andre. Uh, could you use radiometers and signal, uh, signals from beacons uh, from GEO, I'm guessing to do phase calibration. Uh, this is the, the, the reason this question. Um, so at ALMA, which is the telescope in Chile, they do use radiometers to help with the calibration. And we are putting radiometers on some of the telescopes. However, you also have to synchronize this uh, with the the um, with the atomic, we also have to timestamp this with the atomic clock, and it's and it doesn't. Um, I don't think, from what I've heard, I don't think a radiometer is able to account for the precise kind of uh, differences that we need to see on such short time intervals. Um, but this is what I've heard. I know that we can use some of the radiometers to help us with calibration, but it's not for full calibration. Um, and because of that, I actually um, kind of discussed. Uh, we kind of were brainstorming with Shep Dolman and Bikram Ravi, the idea of putting kind of uh, some sort of beacon. Um, it couldn't be in geo because it actually has to track the source. So you, so you have perturbations in the atmosphere that change on the order of, of fractions of a second um, in time and they have a very short coherence length. So that beacon has to track the source in the sky um, and so it can't be in geo. Um, but we, we discussed maybe putting some sort of drone or aircraft in high, at high altitude that we could be used as a beacon so that we could do phase calibration. Um, and I, but it, I think that the, at that high altitude, you have very high winds. Um, and so it would be a very, very difficult and expensive task in itself. Um, and so we decided, decided it wasn't impossible, but there is not the technology available right now to do that. Um, but it, but we, we saw this video where someone was able to put a high altitude drone in, but they weren't able to have much control over it to track the location, the source location. And so um, it is something we're thinking about, but it's not, um, it's not, it's very difficult and a technical challenge itself. Um, okay, so the same question. Have you tried using... Okay, there's another question. Have you tried using the same methods to image the supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way? And it's nearer than M87. And there would be like, likely be a higher frequency EM radiation uh, captured by the EHT array. In that way, the data you collect wouldn't be so sparse and confounded by noise such to large extents. So um, this is the stuff I talked about a little bit at the end. So the, the black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy, that Sagittarius star black hole, is one that we're interested in um, imaging. Uh, M87 and Sagittarius star are the two black holes that we saw would be big, uh, the right size on the sky. So the black hole in Sagittarius star is much uh, smaller, but it's closer to us. So it appears about the same size as the M87 black hole, um, but Sagittarius star is actually more challenging. And it's more challenging because it's evolving really quickly. There's also things like a scattering screen in front of it. 
for us. So for instance, I didn't talk about this at all, but it's kind of like looking at the black hole through a frosted window. There's this interstellar a medium that scatters the black hole. And so actually imaging Saturn star is more challenging than M87, um, but it is something that we're working on actively now. Uh, and a lot of these, these methods that I talked about, like under, like coming up with methods that are able to handle the, the very quick dynamics, the time variability is what we, are, why it's such a challenge. It's an even more ill-posed problem. And so um, building our confidence on the image, uh, on, on the results of Sagittarius star is taking more time, but we hope to get something uh, 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 soon. Um, as far as higher frequency information, the data is the, the same uh, frequency band that we could use. It's, uh, uh, we are observing at about 230 gigahertz, um, pushing to 345 gigahertz um, to get higher resolution. But we can't see, there's just like this little window that we can see um, where, the, uh, where we actually can pierce through all the gas um, and, and see that ring, and also a window that is able to make it through our atmosphere. So that range of about 0.8 millimeters to 1.3 millimeters or 230 gigahertz to 345 uh, gigahertz is the range that we can um, image the black hole in. Uh, another question from Andre is, would it be possible to find the Doppler shift in the data? So that picture of the black hole, remember I said that the bottom is brighter than the top. And so, um, uh, and so that is actually due to Doppler shifting. So, um, because the gas is spinning around close to the speed of light, when the gas is moving towards us, it actually is brighter uh, than, than when it, it's Doppler beamed and it's brighter than when it's moving away from us. So from that, we actually know what direction the black hole is spinning. Um, so uh, if the black hole is oriented at us, it's oriented at the M87 black hole is oriented at about uh, 20 degrees. And so the gas is spinning around like this. And so we actually know from looking at the fact that there's that asymmetry that the gas is moving on the bottom um, uh, towards us and on the top it's moving away from us. And so that means the black hole is spinning, I'll use my right hand, away from, away from us. Um, uh, let's see. Try to find a... The, you're, you're trying to find a, a question you answered before, then you can actually go to the oh. answer. Yeah, yeah. Sure, I was, I was trying to find a question that maybe huh, might uh, be good to answer. Uh, um, maybe uh, a possible, so I hear a question, a possible location for another telescope of the array is at the, uh, maybe at the ISS. Uh, International Space Station. Uh, this is something that um, we have considered, although putting something on the International Space Station uh, is not trivial. And these telescopes are very large. So in space, we're thinking we have to have a telescope at least four meters in, in size. Uh, and um, that's a, quite a large thing. And, and also the International Space Station has modes. So it's kind of wobbling around. And so it's not necessarily the best place to put uh, a dish, although it has been something that we have discussed. Um, Aha, I don't know if you want to comment at all about optimization of telescopes in space, maybe. Oh, yeah, sure. Like, uh, I guess, oh, hi, everyone, I'm her. Uh, I, I guess it can be uh, a little harder compared with the optimization of the array on the telescope, on, on the ground, because uh, the, uh, the, in space, actually, there are many trajectories and the satellite is moving. Uh, so we have more constraints in space for the uh, for the satellite trajectory optimization. But definitely, we can we can do that. Like, uh, uh, because, um, uh, I mean, from the astrodynamics knowledge, like we can uh, we, we have many existing trajectory designs, and definitely we have a very sophisticated. Uh, simulation too. So we can combine our method with, uh, uh, I mean, complicated simulation software. And uh, it's possible that in the future, we will find the best trajectory for the space-based uh, VLBI measurement satellites. I think it's promising. 
think, thanks, Hannah. Yeah, I think that um, it is something that we've started talking about with JPL uh, and other and others as well. So uh, last year we held a, uh, a Keck Institute for Space Science uh, workshop here at Caltech where we discussed potentially um, moving to space uh, and uh, and kind of what would the scientific uh, advantages be. There are clear scientific advantages. You have higher resolution. You can get fa faster t temporal resolution as well, uh, more temporal resolution as well. Of course, it comes with a huge price tag. So the EHT was kind of um, uh, one kind of really awesome part about the EHT is that we were able to recycle telescopes uh, for this purpose. Well, not recycle, they, they're still being used for other purposes, but we could use, they weren't built originally for the EHT, so it was a relatively cheap project. We're putting a tel telescope in space is, you know, at least half a billion dollars uh, so uh, we think, you know, from initial kind of estimates. So it's something that we're uh, interested in, but uh, it, it is something that's more long term. But one part of it is how do you optimize the telescope location? So this is something that uh, we'll also be working on. Um, I don't know if there's time for any more questions. Should I, can I, should I continue answering the questions or? Yes, yes, please. Okay, yeah. okay sure. Um, so I, I see one question. Uh, have, have you done any measurements in, in October using the Earth orbit as a base? So this is a good question. Some people ask, well, can you use, uh, you know, the, um, can we take measurements in April and then compare them to the measurements made in October and the Earth has changed location. And so you can, uh, you have a really long baseline. The problem is we have to make measurements that are synchroni uh, synchronized. And so um, you cannot, um, you cannot take measurements and then compare them and then look at the time delay for a measurement that is, uh, you know, months down the line. It actually has to be simultaneously me measurement, uh, simultaneous measurements. Um, and that's because like the, the kind of the signal coming from the black hole is basically like Gaussian random noise. And we are trying to find correlations in, in, in basically this noise. So that's why we have to have atomic clocks at every station to precisely time them. And in the end, we get... Um, uh, we have to align the signals to um, less than a picosecond, a fraction of a pre picosecond in temporal difference. I think this answers another one of the questions too. Let's see. Okay, there's a question. Was the network of telescopes in the massive data project synchronized or did part of the team need to write an algorithm to temporally align the data? So at the telescopes, we capture GPS information and also information from a, a, a atomic clock, a, a, um, a maser, a hydrogen maser at each one of the telescope locations. And so the GPS gives a really rough time alignment and the atomic clock gives us more precise time alignment. You would, based upon this, you can do an initial, um, uh, you do an initial alignment to find the phase difference um, using, remember I talked about this uh, correlator. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, for you. So this this correlator here does the initial um, synchronization, um, finding measurements with an initial alignment. Um, and then the second part, this calibration part, is uh, more precisely tuning it. So that second part is important for getting uh, the alignment down to a fraction of a picosecond that we need to actually uh, image. And that's because the data is um, uh, such short wavelength data, one millimeter wavelength. And so we have to be very precise in the timing of the signals. Let's see if there's any other questions. Oh, uh, question maybe for Ha. Uh, do you train your decoder generator on synthetic data only? And the reconstruction of the decoder is ill posed problem and our priors are very limited. Uh, so the decoder just hallucinates. How, so how do you ensure the fairness of the obtain, obtained results? So I'll just ask how maybe the first question, do you train your, your decoder generator on synthetic data only? Um, oh yeah, sure. Currently, like because we have very good simulation too. I think someone also asked that question. So currently we, are, we only train our encoder and decoder using synthetic data. And actually uh, to make sure that our telescope design can be able to uh, can 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 be used for uh, I mean imaging uh, many many targets and instead of only the 
uh, the ring-like structure. Actually, we train our uh, autoencoder using the uh, a synthetic data set, a fashion amnest, and then test our uh, trained autoencoder on the real black hole simulation image and other data set. And we find the results are pretty good. Uh, so definitely like uh, in the future, um, they also want to incorporate the system errors or calibration errors in our uh, net, I mean, telescope network design. So we are also developing techniques that try to uh, combine the synthetic data and the real measurement data from EHT. Uh, yeah, it's still uh, on developing. Yeah, so we wanted initially to not be, to, to not, you know, be, trying to train on a specific kind of image we wanted to say what telescopes would give us would we allow you know would allow us to uh, reconstruct arbitrary images so for that we are not using any kind of black hole simulations or anything for our training data it's actually very generic like mnist fashion mnist data um there are some assumptions like the field of view and stuff like that that are our uh, image assumptions that are definitely being put into the networks now, but you can retrain with different assumptions as well. Um, and uh, so a uh, huh, second half of the question is because the decoder is just hallucinating because it's an ill post problem. How do we ensure the fairness uh, of the obtained results. Uh... Yeah, actually, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Like, uh, uh, actually, I, I, I think Katie has already mentioned like that for, for our training, like we, we have a diversity loss in our, uh, in our autoencoder loss function. And uh, uh, that's actually that will help us explore uh, multiple telescope array designs and our reconstruction method can try to uh, do reconstructions for, I mean, it's kind of something like a explore exploit uh, uh, method, like that we, we try multiple uh, array designs and that then try to use our reconstruction uh, network to handle the reconstruction uh, under different telescope uh, array configurations. And I think that can be uh, helpful, helpful to ensure the fairness of the obtained results. Uh, uh, is that good? Answer yeah, that so question. I, I would also say that um, when we are talking about this co-design problem at the end, uh, where we're trying to optimize the telescope location at the same time as the reconstruction network, um, we are right now posing it as a co-design, but really what we're trying to get after is the telescope locations. And I think in order to use any kind of reconstruction network, it would have to have at this point a huge lot more vetting um, done to it before we would actually be confident in, in using that on any data. And even once you are confident it works on synthetic data, you know, it took us nine months or something, cl close to a year uh, to, fig to actually release an image after we had made an image with methods that we had, uh, you know, had developed for years before then. So it's not something that it's like, okay, once we had checked that this method works, then we just output the result. There's a lot of validation that needs to be done uh, because of the fact that it is such sparse and noisy data. So we're like, we're trying to go towards fully automated, but still, you know, we want to make sure before release any results that um, even with the methods that we're using, that they're doing something reasonable. You always have to kind of check that. Um, so I think that the goal of the section at the end, the last part is really about how do we design the future of the Event Horizon Telescope? How do we expand this um, to, to being able to be better? <laughs> and we don't have to take a year to analyze the results. Uh, but as far as like me believing uh, the results of using these uh, neural networks on some sort of new data set, I, that would take, we ha that takes a lot of time. Um, so Aviad has also joined us and Aviad has been working um, not just on the dynamic part of the um, reconstructing the dynamics, but also on uh, applying uh, methods uh, uh, for other imaging such as the um, that we're doing in the HT. So maybe this would be a good question, Aviad, for you. Um, can you talk about what denoising algorithms or what kind of priors we're using in this context? Uh, and also, um, I think I saw some question that was like, 
what kind of regularizers are we using and, and stuff like that? Or can you just discuss maybe what, what, what kind of regularization do we do use? Yeah, sure. Um, I think Katie talked a little bit about the, um, the imaging of videos where we uh, sort of have a twofold constraint. So one constraint was that each image in the video chain would be from some prior or constrained to some prior distribution of images that are likely to occur. And then the next constraint would be the continuity of the frames, right? So another constraint there would be we want to have a video that has sort of a continuous motion. Um, so these are the two main constraints other than, of course, the data constraints um, that we use to constrain the data. Um, I guess for the, the methods that I was working on or that I'm still working on um, to developing, the constraints are, are fairly similar, but also somewhat different, right? So we still want to maintain video continuity, but we're enforcing this by some underlying model that generates continuous videos. Um, another question that was sort of relevant and I, I, I answered in the chat was about uh, the difference between um, the MRI sampling and reconstruction methods and this VLBI, um, Katie. So um, I guess well, what I wrote down, but Katie, you worked also on MRI, so you probably have more experience in this, um, is that I think the VLBI is, is special in a sense that you have way sparser measurements, like much more, much less measurements. And also the noise terms are quite unique. Um, so the, the site dependency of noise due to the atmospheric corruption, that's quite unique to VLBI. So I don't think that you can plug and play MRI uh, approaches into VLBI. Yeah, that, that's uh, great. I think I agree. So the data is much sparser, sparser, the data is noisier, but there are a lot of similarities. I mean, uh, the clear one is they both sample something about the frequency domain of the image. And another one is that um, there is a uh, time evolving MRI, like when you're um, like a, for infant um, MRI, um, pediatric MRI, where the child's head is not staying still, or, or fetal MRI, when the baby inside the mother's womb is not staying still. These are things where the, me the source is evolving over time. The person is moving around, right? And so the measurements are not from a static image, similar to us having a, a a dynamic black hole where we're sampling them. So there's a lot of parallels between the two, but you do really have to be quite careful about how the measurements and how they are uh, collected, what kinds of noise you expect on them, because they're quite different in that way. Um, yeah, cool. Um, another question I see here from Matthew is, would it be possible to place more frequency specific and low cost antennas around the earth uh, for phase and noise corrections, and maybe ones that are not trying to get more, uh, uh, you know, measurements, uh, more measurements of the from the frequency domain, but it helps to do the calibration. And this is a great question, um, and one that we so as I talked about, we had we observed um, in 2017 with eight telescopes. Actually, two of those telescopes were at. Uh, the same location. So we had two telescopes next to each other in Hawaii and two telescopes next to each other in Chile. And this provides um, uh, redundant baselines where we can do calibration of the amplitude. Um, so we can't do, uh, it's harder to do, well, you can do some information about calibration of the phase, but it's more important for calibration of the amplitude um, to have these redundant telescope sites. Of course, it's very expensive. You can't just, it, it, they can be cheaper, but they're still, they have to collect the signal, so they still are very expensive. Um, and so you can't, uh, you know, you you are sacrificing putting that in a different location where you're getting a new measurement versus doing calibration. So this is something that we would want, want to explore in the work, the, the simultaneous array design and um, imaging work that I discussed at the end, because do we want, let's say we have four telescopes and we can place them. Should we make them redundant baselines for, to deal with that calibration error or should we put them at new locations? So this is something that that can help answer uh, because it can incorporate all the kind of the nonlinearities and complications of the noise, which analytically we haven't been able to do so far. Let's see if there's any. There's another question, Katie, that you might be able to answer. <laughs> 
And yeah. um, so Alan is asking, can you adapt EHG to improve imaging of close, fast moving objects? Um, I think you can turn it into a more general question, which is, are, can we use EHT to look at other objects other than the two that you've described and what kind of objects is EHT used to look at? Yeah, thanks, Avian. So, the, um, so we use the EHT to look at other sources. Um, other, um, they are other black holes, but at black holes where we can't actually observe them, uh, observe their, the, the signature of their event highlights. And we can't see that ring of light, but we see the jets coming off of them. So we observe these other active galactic nuclei with the EHT. Also, we use EHT data to look for pulsars, uh, which are really important, um, another thing to look for. But um, things like um, on, on Amana, I forget how to pronounce it, but this fast moving thing that went through our solar system. Um, there, so the one thing is the EHT is designed at a certain uh, wavelength. So it's designed to observe one millimeter wavelengths, actually right now 1.3 millimeter wavelengths. Um, and so you have to have a source that is, uh, that is uh, bright enough in that uh, frequency range, that, that wavelength. Um, and another thing is that it has to be the right size. So actually, so I'm guessing that this, uh, that this uh, object actually was quite a bit larger than, uh, than what the black holes uh, look like. And so uh, the, then the size of the black holes. And so we actually, it might even be fully resolved out with the HT. So you really have to design a telescope array where the baselines are the right size and they're observing at the right frequency to kind of capture a sort a, a certain types of sources. Another thing that uh, is a bad about the EHT is that right now we all have to travel out to the telescopes, you know, spend two weeks there putting the equipment together before we collect any data. It's not uh, something where we can log into our computers and, and when there's something exciting, just press go and collect the data. But we hope that in the next, uh, this is something that we hope to push towards to move the EHT towards the facility where we could do on-demand kind of observing uh, uh, if something exciting were to happen. But it's not really possible right now. Um, but yeah, something that we want to do because we don't all, as fun as it is to go out for two weeks at a telescope, it's very tiring. And it's, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, we, we lose like a month of time uh, for everybody. And so um, it's something that we're hoping to, to do more of in the future is getting it to be a facility where other people can propose to observe objects. Um, yeah. Any, or Avia, do you see any other good questions that we should answer? I'm sorry, I'm trying to like scroll between them. Uh, not... Katie, I had a question. Yeah. So Maybe I wonder if I missed this, but have you looked at like optimizing the satellite locations, but dealing with like clean or the maximum likelihood reconstruction in the decoder, and possibly this could reduce the, uh, you know, this could allow you to train those locations from limited data. So you could do you you could not choose not to treat it as a co-design problem, and you could just put in a like a regular as maximum likelihood approach into the, I think it'd be hard to do a clean because clean is manual. You actually have to have users actually go in and, and click on things, but um, uh, for the most part. So for the, um, for the uh, maximum likelihood, you could, you could have some sort of unrolled network that you put in, uh, in as the decoder. Um, and uh, HA has been kind of exploring that this a little bit with, for not for the uh, event horizon telescope stuff, but for FOIA tychography uh, microscopy. So, huh, maybe you want to discuss a little bit more about the advantages of the co-design versus not co-designing. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I think the, the question really makes sense. Like, we do notice that if we just replace the decoder with some existing uh, for, uh, recon reconstruction method like a maximum likelihood estimation or regularized max maximum likelihood es estimation, we can, we can uh, I mean, try to use, we can reduce the number of, uh, the amount of data we need for the training, definitely. Uh, but that also means that we do not take full advantage of the, uh, of, like uh, of, the, of the reconstruction capability. Like, because for, for, the, uh, for the existing, 
reconstruction method, actually we have to fine tune which um, uh, prior knowledge, where, which regularizer we want to use. And uh, for example, for our HT case, actually that can be very hard. Like we find that um, uh, we have very complicated noises. In that case, uh, for the co-design framework, actually uh, we can better considering the, uh, the interaction between the uh, sampler, the encoder part, and the reconstruction, the decoder part. And uh, we do know, actually we are also, like, like actually we are currently working on some, working on testing the, working on comparing the existing uh, MLE based method and the uh, deep, deep learning based reconstruction method. And we do think the, the deep learning based method can help achieve a better black hole image. Uh, oh well, maybe we should not say that it's still under testing, but uh, there are some advantage for the for the deep learning assistant reconstruction, uh, and uh, that's why we are doing co-design right now. But as Katie said, we uh, yeah actually we are trying we, we are currently exploring using some uh, free setography example to test the the, the design. Uh, of only the sampling part, but not the reconstruction part. And we do think that's also promising. Uh, yeah. Yeah, one thing to, to, to keep in mind is that because the measurements that we use are so, uh, have this kind of, we're doing this kind of phase retrieval problem. And so the noise is kind of messy. It, when you have different telescope designs, you don't, um, you often find that you need to tune the parameters quite differently for the image reconstruction method. So even though you might use the same core method, uh, oftentimes when I, when you're observing different sources or you have different telescope arrays, you want, you actually tune these parameters differently. So it actually does make it, it's not just because it's not something that you can think about fully in a probabilistic way with the, uh, with the Bayesian method. Um, and so for that reason, um, some level of co-design does help you in recovering a best image so that you allow yourself to vary the parameters for different designs. Is that clear? Yes, that sounds that sounds good to me. Yeah, that's. I think it's a it's a nice area with interesting um, questions to explore. But it's uh, exciting what you know what uh, you and her have been attempting. Thanks. Yeah. Um, one other question that I think it would be good to to answer here, um, and and Ha and Aviat, I think you should chime in too. Is that I think I've seen a lot of questions where people are saying, "Oh, we're we're hallucinating, we're making up using our imaginations and everything." And I think you know it's important to understand that the yes, the data that we have is sparse. We are making up some level of information, but. That is this case with basically all computational imaging methods, right? We go in and you get an MRI scan. Uh, it's also, you know, there is some information that is being injected into the problem in order to recover the picture, yet you still operate, right? Of course, the level of information uh, that you have uh, from the measurements is maybe different than we have from the black hole, but that's why it took uh, such a long time where we analyzed oh, under different assumptions, under different parameter settings, under different kinds of bias, how does that affect the image? And we wanted to make sure that no matter the types of bias we incorporated, we always got, we still recovered the same scientific conclusion of this ring. The precise, the precise uh, variations of around the ring, maybe we don't, you know, maybe we don't trust that fully, but this ring, we have a, a lot of, of, of faith in. Um, for example, here is, I'm showing um, some, just a sample of results from one of these parameter surveys I talked about, where it's just where I just we varied just two of the parameters, uh, the uh, two of the regularizers, the maximum entropy and the total variation, um, and you can see as you change the fraction, the proportion of these two, uh, um, these two regularizing terms, that the image changes, right? As you add more total variation, it becomes more flatter piecewise smoothish until it kind of disappears. But at this point, you can actually tell if you look at the um, measurements, that the, 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 if you look at the results, it actually doesn't fit the data. And by doing tests on synthetic data, we knew that these, the ones in green, were really the ones that performed best, the best parameter settings. And so we, by looking over many different kinds of synthetic data that had ring, that had holes and no holes and totally non black hole structures. We looked at snowmen even, uh, you know, we did tests on, uh, here I can show you another one. Uh, 
We did tests to make sure that we could recover surprising structure when no one knew about it, like a snowman. We, these are things that we did to test ourselves to make sure that, yes, there's always some level of, of hallucination that's happening, but make sure that the scientific conclusions of the ring of that size, that that, that is something that we really believe. Ha, and Aviad, I don't know if you want to chime in here with. Yeah, I, I also like to add um, that th this is something that I don't think you touched on in the talk, that there is another team that is not even doing um, Bayesian inference or uh, so maximum likelihood estimation or uh, clean. And, and these, th this team is actually doing purely sampling based and they're getting at the posteriors of these structures. So that's another effort that uh, is part of the EHT. That's a different team. Um, and they're actually retrieving posteriors. So, so that's another thing um, to add there. That's a great point, Aviad. Here, I can show you um, some of that. So here we looked at like the images that we had created and looked at ring, the extracting the ring. So let's say our goal is to figure out the size of the ring. That, that's an important feature because it relates to the mass of the black hole. So it's an important scientific feature that we want out of it. So we could look over lots of different images and extract the ring size. And we saw that no matter the method we used and the day that we observed, they were all consistent in the ring size that we got from the images uh, when we looked over huge parameter settings for this. But then as Avi had said, we also, there was a group of people um, who worked on just sampling methods, uh, fitting uh, crescent models to the data. So it was not, there was no imaging involved. It was just fitting models where you could get posteriors um, here. And they also saw a consistent uh, diameter that they got out of it. So here you can see they got something where it also was consistent about 42 micro arc second. And, and they also sample, as Avi had said, something about the posterior. And so all these methods were able to recover a very similar uh, uh, underlying feature of the data. Uh, Kiki, there is a one last question yeah. here in the from Slava. Can you is that you can answer a question? Or oh, is that uh, the the SKA. Yeah. So the square kilometer array. Um, we don't plan to use it in the uh, future uh, research. I, I'm you know I um, I'm not sure of the details of uh, what, like okay. So the square kilometer array is an array of telescopes like the ALMA telescope. The ALMA telescope in Chile is something like 60 telescopes and we phase them all together. So we collect the signals and we combine all the signals together to create one, uh, like so that it all acts as one telescope. And this took many years to do called the phased array, uh, uh, to phase up the array. The, so we did the, the ALMA phasing project. And so now we can use ALMA all together basically as one site that has the collecting area of some crazy large telescope. I can't remember exact what the equivalent diameter is. Um, for the square kilometer array, I haven't heard of plans about that. That would uh, be a huge effort. Um, and I'm actually not sure actually even, um, I should know this, but uh, exactly if they are able to observe at uh, 230 gigahertz. It's a, pretty, uh, it's a pretty high frequency for radio telescopes. So a lot of telescopes in around the world do not observe at this frequency, which is why um, it is so hard to find telescopes that we can add to the EHT array. Um, many telescopes like the VLBA and the, um, uh, in the uh, VLT, sorry, not VLT, um, the telescope in, the, in, in, like in contact, I forget what the name is, V, uh, I'm blanking. Um, these don't observe at the uh, short enough wavelength. Uh, and so they observe at, at shortest at a three millimeter wavelength. And so we can't incorporate them. So there's all these telescopes around. We'd love to incorporate that we can't. So, but I don't know the details of the SKA, but, um, we, but it would, there isn't plans to incorporate it now. Great. I think pretty much all the question has been answered, I guess. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, it was really a lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Haiti, for your excellent talk and also spending so much time to answering the questions. Yeah, sure. I think I will, maybe it'd be good to end with one of the questions at the beginning that I, I, uh, that I thought it would be good to answer technical questions first. But I see a question okay. of what is it like to work on a team uh, on, on something like this? And um, I think it's awesome. It's, you know, it's obviously challenging uh, writing a paper with so many authors, but it's awesome to have people from the, around the world that, you know, it, 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 is a, it is a project that requires people working together closely from around the world. And it's a lot of fun. Um, and hopefully Ha and Aviad have also, uh, now that they've started working on this project, well, hopefully they've also um, met lots of people from around the world and, and are having fun with it too. I don't know if you guys want to comment as well. Yeah, I think it's very inspiring on my part. Um, I, I find it very inspiring to see how people are passionate about this. Um, even in these times, even in Corona time, everyone is working so hard. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There might be another question. Yeah, do you still get collector data during this uh, this pandemic? So you have a, I guess it should be difficult to do this international collaboration nowadays, right? Yeah, unfortunately, we had to cancel. So we can only observe once a year. We actually we have to propose for time. So it's not like guaranteed. We have to put in a proposal. Um, and so we were planning. We were going to observe at. Was it end of March, huh? or early April? And uh, yeah. early April, but we yeah. we cancel observation this year. But we do, uh, we did some rehearsal observations, like uh, try to pretend we can observe for the practice next year. So we are still working. Yeah, how maybe you want to tell about talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah, basically like uh, because we are coordinating telescopes across the globe every night because the weather at different sites at different. Uh, I mean, maybe influenced by the weather. So uh, we, we need to decide whether to proceed our observations uh, like uh, before the be before the observations start every night. Uh, so even though we can now do observation this year, we have the vessel monitoring uh, at the each site. So we, we still work and, pre and pretend we are observing and make that decisions every day. And it's a very exciting, like a, like a like a very exciting work like based a lot of scientists across the world uh, yeah yeah so it's fun we're still trying to you know work together we actually uh we we had a a, a workshop a month ago or so where we all worked it was like a 24-hour workshop because we would pass the baton you know to the next uh time zone and 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 always be working together so it was a lot of fun uh so we're trying to you know make the most of it during this time but yeah <laughs> Great, great. It was a lot of fun to listen to your talk as well. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your time and all your excellent talk. And yeah, I think so a small announcement before we're wrapping up today's seminar. So as, as you know that this is a bi-weekly seminar. And then from now on, if you register in, you can actually get a reminder email automatically. And next time, in two weeks later, I'm going to talk. Yeah, so anyway, so please stay tuned and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much, Kathy, and also everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Katie. Bye. Bye.